Thank you for inviting me to share my research with you. I'm undertaking a biographical study of the Dodge family and the Mississippi River Valley, covering the years 1776 through the 1860s. Henry Dodge is a well-known figure um, here in Wisconsin. Uh, he was the first Wisconsin territorial governor and in 1848 was elected to be one of the first two senators from the new state of Wisconsin. Dodge and his family are emblematic of the settler colonizers in the transitional multicultural polyglot region of the early Midwest borderlands. Dodge worked his way into leadership positions in regions that were in a great deal of flux. Within the power vacuum that can result during transition of sovereignty and economy, he found tremendous opportunity. I want to acknowledge that at this moment, I occupy a home that is sited on Ho-Chunk land. While Platteville, Wisconsin does not appear to have been a Ho-Chunk village site, it certainly was part of the Ho-Chunk planting and mining region, and the Platte Mound may well have been a sacred gathering place. Due to the time limitations of my talk tonight, I wanna to focus on just one issue related to Henry Dodge's first years in the Michigan Territory Lead Mine District. This is related to his illegal mining and smelting activities in Ho-Chunk Territory. Present day Southwest Wisconsin and the proximity with the proximity of the Mississippi River Corridor provided opportunities for vast trade networks to flourish. The region was in a complex transition, moving from a mixed cultural fur trading economy with French, British, and Creole societies living in Native American lands to a predominantly Anglo-American culture, anxious to remove Native Americans with an economy based on national and international commodities, such as pigs of Finnish lead and later wheat flour and other agricultural products. Henry Dodge had already navigated these same kinds of transitions while living in Upper Louisiana during its transition from French to American sovereignty. He became sheriff of St. Genevieve County, a large and prosperous region in present day Missouri. That region was transitioning from a population of majority Francophone habitants to American settlers. As Henry Dodge acquired more power and influence in Upper Miss Louisiana, he helped put into operation the steps required to move the Mississippi, uh, pardon me, the Missouri Territory to statehood, which it achieved in 1821. With his experience as a sheriff and marshal, supervisor of the territorial court system, militia leader, as well as entrepreneur in many industries, including salt making and lead mining, Dodge was ready to take on new challenges in the largely uncharted Upper Mississippi Lead Mine District. When he and his family left Missouri in 1827, Dodge was about, uh, he was 45 years old. This picture, he was about 40 years old. He had just lost his large home to the highest bidder as the Bank of Missouri foreclosed on his mortgage. He traveled by steamboat with his wife, Christiana, and several of his children. In a consciously illegal act, he brought five enslaved workers to the free territory of Michigan. He undoubtedly knew many people who had already left for the Upper Mississippi Lead Mine District centered at Galena, Illinois. Beginning in 1822, there had been a chain migration of miners, lawyers, traders, and businessmen who left St. Genevieve County for the lead rush to the north. Travel to the Fever River Lead Mine District at Galena was much easier by 1823 when the first steamboat chugged its way up the Mississippi River. Galena was becoming a busy port town on the Fever or Galena River, some six miles upstream from its outflow to the Mississippi River. The commodity that fueled its growth was lead ore or Galena. Yeah. La Pointe, at, <clears throat> pardon me, as Galena was first known, had already served as a fur trading center. The Meskwaki Fox uh, Village site and a place where lead ore was mined and smelted by the Creole Métis, Meskwaki, Sauk, and Ho-Chunk peoples. The year 1827 can be considered the lead rush of 27, akin, akin to the gold rush of 49. Suddenly, thousands of white miners were digging sucker holes all around the upper Mississippi lead mine district and slipping into caves, looking for easy to dig lead ore. 
They crossed into present day Southwest Wisconsin from Galena, bringing their picks and gads into an area that had not yet been surveyed by the federal government. When R.H. Chandler drew his map of the lead mine district in 1828, he estimated 10,000 whites were in the mining district. For comparison, the Chicago area white population was under 300 persons. The lead rush quickly transformed the region. Tensions mounted between native peoples and the lead miners. The many nations of the region had engaged in mining for decades and had success successfully kept whites from establishing a foothold in their mines. However, from 1822, the US military was more willing to involve itself with enforcing mining claims made by the white newcomers. Skirmishes and killings in the district led to an attempt to clarify and delineate the land claims made by the many nations and the US government. This is the famous R.W. Chandler map published in 1828, drawn in uh, 29 drawn in 1828 that delineates the upper Mississippi lead mine district as a federal district owned and controlled by the U.S. government. Only a week before Henry Dodge and his family arrived at the port of Galena, Wanig Suchka or Redbird, a Ho-Chunk chief, with some of his warriors had committed a heinous crime against a family of non-native intruders who were living on Ho-Chunk land near Prairie de Chine. Wisconsin. In this case, Redbird was compelled to cover the dead as he believed two of his warriors had been killed at the hands of the American government. To cover the dead was a Native American practice of killing or kidnapping one of the enemy to replace tribal members who were enslaved or killed. Redbird's brutal attack, which caused the death of two men and the maiming of a baby, had the lead mine district on high alert for fear that more bloody attacks were soon to come. Miners and their families were in a panic, building fortifications around their home sites and leaving remote camps altogether for Galena and other populated areas. While waiting for the arrival of federal troops under the command of General Henry Atkinson, Dodge left his wife and family in the safety of Galena while he took command, organizing a local defense from Galena. To attain the honor of militia leader, he had to raise a larger group of supporters among the miners than a rival from Illinois, who was also an experienced militia leader. After a rowdy, drunken standoff, the miners chose Dodge to lead the campaign to get Redbird. He raised over 100 mounted volunteers to patrol the region from Prairie du Chien to Muscaday along the Wisconsin River, and then they continued northeast all the way to the portage at the Fox River. With him on this expedition were his two teenage sons, Henry and Augustus. Their goal was to capture the renegade Redbird and bring him to justice. But he was nowhere to be found. Father and sons, along with their militia squad, saw no battles during the summer of 1827. They rode for days under the summer sun, apparently ill-prepared with little food to sustain them. Redbird had managed to elude the ragtag militia for a full month. <clears throat> However, Upon learning the news that Atkinson's federal troops had arrived at Prairie du Chien, Redbird chose to surrender. He wanted to avoid an all-out confrontation between the Ho-Chunk and the arriving U.S. military. He wanted to protect his people from devastating warfare. This map, a uh, really cool map, 1833, we're already seeing um, Dodge's Grove here and his um, all roads lead to Dodge's diggings here. And then we see the Wisconsin River and then the portage where the Wisconsin and the Fox Rivers come together. Very, very, whoops, very, very important uh, trade area, which had a uh, Indian fort and um, a trading post and a US military fort. And Prairie du Chien is over on the other side with another fort. Um, and so this route becomes very important. It becomes Route 18, which was the military road. Um, today it's called 18. I missed a picture. There we go. Dressed in his best white deerskin uniform, Redford told his captors, 
I do not understand the white man's laws, which has one set of words for the white man and another for the red. He went on to say, the white men promised us the lead mines would be ours, but they did nothing to put the men who came to possession away from them. We have been patient. We have seen the ancient burial grounds plowed over. We have seen our brave shot down like dogs for stealing corn. We have seen our women mocked and raped. We have seen the white Tracy, are you still there? <clears throat> oh. Okay. I'm sure she'll be right back with us. You know, this is like every MHA meeting where we have some kind of tech crisis. Yeah. Like the microphone's not working in Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> or giving people salad in Scranton with no uh, utensils. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, our internet's been not good lately and I I'm really worried about it because I can't seem to count on it lately. Do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen again. Um, I apologize for that. I'm just having a hell of a time. Okay. Are we good? We good? Yep. yep. Okay. okay. I'm hearing a lot of feedback. <laughs> That's better. Still hearing feedback, but can you hear it? Barb, are we good? Hello, Barb. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. To punish the Ho-Chunk, a temporary treaty was signed between the federal government and the Ho-Chunk Nation, which was soon followed by another treaty in 1829 which removed all Ho-Chunk villages south of the Wisconsin River and away from the lead mine district. So you can see the successions of land over time from 29 uh, through 37. <clears throat> when Dodge planted himself in the Ho-Chunk lands of the Michigan Territory in 1827, he was aware that the Indians had agreed not to harm white miners who mined south of the Wisconsin River until a review of the land claims, both Ho-Chunk and white, could be completed. He was also aware that due to the Treaty of 1816, white miners were confined to their mining operations to a large federal reserve of five leagues square. Dodge, however, flouted the treaty provision by setting up his new mining camp outside the reserve and within Ho-Chunk territory in present day Dodgeville, Wisconsin. He did not have a permit from the federal land office in Galena to mine at this encampment. It appears Dodge developed his diggings and built a smelting furnace by midsummer 1827. Michigan territorial judge James, uh, judge James Doty called on Dodge at his new compound in late July that year and found cabins surrounded by a formidable stockade and the miners liberally supplied with ammunition. At any given time, between 50 and 200 armed miners lived at the camp. Dodge's stockade fort was near his largest mine as were about 20 log houses. A double furnace for smelting ore was nearby. According to Louis Pelzer, Dodge's biographer, the family, quote, lived in a rude log cabin. This structure made from hewn timbers and without a particle of sawed lumber boasted of a puncheon floor and a clapboard roof. So 
he, Dodge and his family were living pretty rough. From autumn through the winter of 1827 to 28, they worked his diggings, finishing between $3,000 and $4,000 worth of lead. Actually, that should say $30,000 and $40,000 worth of lead. This illegal buckshot claim was in defiance of federal policies in effect in U.S. mining districts from 1807. Beginning that year, all lead mining claims in Indian territory were to be leased, not purchased, and for a maximum of five years. Finished lead was to be taxed at 10%. While the laws were initially made to control the Missouri lead mine district, the policies were more effective in the upper Mississippi River mining district. Dodge had to fight for his diggings, not only as he was in Ho-Chunk territory, because other white miners declared they had already staked a claim in the same area. Using force, the Dodge gang pushed the white competitors off the claim. In order to keep the peace with his Ho-Chunk hosts, Dodge paid a chief named Bear in gifts for the right to live and mine on their lands. In January 1828, the Indian agent at Prairie de Chine, Joseph M. Street, aware of Dodge's trespassing and digging without a license, was concerned that the chief named Bear might be happy with the arrangement, but other Ho-Chunk leaders were not. A leader named Karamorni, the lame, also known as Walking Turtle, told the agent, quote, we promised not to interrupt the white people at the Fever River mines. Then they were digging near the line. Now a large camp has gone far into our... Tracy, are you still there, Tracy? Okay, we seem to have lost her again. Well, we'll try one more time to get through this if she comes back. Barbara, this is Henry. Um, we found in some Zoom meetings that we've had that if people mute um, their audio, so off their video during the presentation, it might help. Okay. All right. But I think, Right now, especially for her, it, it, it seems to be her uh, her connection. But yeah, everybody can turn their cameras off and mute. And that'll help with any uh, feedback also. Hope she can get back. While we're waiting for Tracy, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, an 1827 cabin from the original Dodge camp that Tracy's been talking about still exists and can be seen in the city of Dodgeville. Uh, Periodically, they have it open for sort of a self-guided tour. It's not much to see. It's a pretty small structure, but it's just interesting to see the cabin from 1827, and, and it's from the camp that Tracy was talking about. And for what, more, what, what? Further, is she back? I thought oh, I'd what? mention for those of you who are not from Wisconsin that the Wisconsin state flag has two people on it. One a Great Lakes sailor and the other a miner. And at the feet of the miner is a stack of lead ingots. Not many state flags have that sort of thing. No, it's, that, that's right. And, and uh, the sad fact of the matter is, is some of our politicians now refer to the miner as a yeoman. I don't know where they got that. <laughs> what was that double scotch hearth furnace that we visited on the Galena tour? I think we saw one that was being you know, 
<laughs> excavator or something. That that was on Johnny. That was a single furnace. That was the one at Potosi down in uh, in Hippie Hollow uh, in Potosi, and that's uh, that's a nice one. It's in pretty good shape considering its vintage. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> so embarrassing. I'm just dying over here. I better drink some more wine. <laughs> Well, let's hope the third time uh, will be the charm. I'm almost done here. Should we keep going? Yes, please. I'm really sorry. I, I can't do anything about this. If I can't get through it this time, I'm just going to go away and you guys can have a good time, okay? All right. <laughs> All right. Last chance. See what happens. There's my screen share. Okay. All righty, let's try one more time. Okay, we were talking about Dodge being uh, hassled because he was in illegal territory. Yes, he was. So um, the Indian sub-agent John Marsh rode some 60 miles from the federal fort at Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin over rough wintry terrain to reach Dodge's diggings. He was sent to inform Dodge and his miners in the vicinity that they were trespassing on established Ho-Chunk mining lands and would be removed by military force. Dodge um, gathered his men together in a show of force. He announced to them that since the area was contested between the Ho-Chunk, Chippewa, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, there really were no lines of clear demarcation. He declared that until he knew for sure who claimed the land, he would not leave unless removed by a force stronger than his own. It seems highly unlikely that Dodge did not know about the uh, details of the Treaty of Prairie du in 1825, when all the leaders of the regional nations gathered at the request of the American government to delineate their land claims to avoid intertribal warfare. The treaty was meant to only clarify land claims by native nations and no land was ceded to the US government at that time. From reading the treaty and viewing a map that shows the agreed upon lines, Dodge's diggings sat about 30 miles inside the demarcated Ho-Chunk lands. Street hoped to engage the services of federal soldiers from Fort Crawford at Prairie du Chien, but there simply were not enough soldiers there to release dozens to do the unpopular work of removing whites from native lands. To end the dispute, in June 1828, the St. Louis Superintendent of Indian Affairs William Clark ordered a reevaluation of the Ho Chunk boundary line. Conveniently, they found that Dodge's diggings were within the Federal Mineral Reserve and not on Ho Chunk land after all. Dodge then received a legal mining lease for his diggings. Throughout this debacle, Dodge had been paying off Bear, a Ho Chunk chief, to use the land. So it seems disingenuous that he would state that he wasn't sure which band or nation laid claim to the acreage he occupied. In fact, when the federal agent began demanding government rents on lead smelters, Dodge changed his story, claiming that since he bought the land from the Indians, he was exempt altogether. Once he, his land uh, claim was secured and, and was recognized by the federal government, he did pay the 10% lead rent due from smelters. In July 1828, he turned over $3,438 worth of refined lead to the government making his profits over $30,000 in that month alone. The government had caved when it came to Dodge's illegal mining. He was a popular, popular leader among the miners and he pressed for their rights and privileges. He went on to be appointed Colonel of the Western Michigan Territorial Militia during a far more consequential battle with Indians over rights to the lead mine district. That of course was the war against Black Hawk, a sock leader, and it occurred in 1832. In conclusion, Henry Dodge and his family, wife Christiana, took a huge risk in coming to the Wisconsin Lead Mine District. Many a Southern sucker came and went empty handed after a season of unproductive mining. The Dodge family left the well-established cultural city of St. Genevieve where Henry held top positions. He overreached in his ambitions there, amassed huge debts and saw his brick home sold to the highest bidder. He came into the rough and tumble frontier upper, upper Mississippi River lead mine area administered from afar and poorly regulated. He knew the laws but had no problem breaking them. He used a combination of bullying, stalling, and cajoling, along with reasoned argument and populist sentiment 
to become one of the most revered yet controversial men of the Upper Mississippi Lead Mine District. Thank you. Yay, thank you very much, Tracy. Thanks, Tracy. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, thank questions, you. comments? Tracy, uh, you already yeah. mentioned the, uh, the uh, Dodge cabin that can be seen in Dodgeville. Yeah, that can be seen in Dodgeville. Um, I don't, you probably know more about it than I do. I don't know about the veracity of that claim that it's actually his cabin. It was one of the cabins that was down in the Grove, I think, or what is, no, it was one of the cabins that was in the town. It was his first diggings, I think. But um, I haven't seen the documentation proving that it was his. If they say it is, so I have to go with that, I guess. I, I don't know if they still say it was his. I think they say it was part of the camp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they say it's part of the camp. So it's a cool little cabin. I've never been inside. It's usually locked. You have to get an appointment, I guess. Is there any relation of this Dodge to the Dodge of Phelps Dodge? Is that the Civil War guy? No, that's a different Dodge. No, no I think the, no Dodge is a, Dodge. the Dodge is a Phelps Dodge. I think we're from Connecticut, New York. No, nope, different family. No, nope. they were mercantilists. Um, Which Tracy, I, I, I really think the, the, the slave issue, <clears throat> you, you might want to elaborate a little bit. I'm sure you know the story about when he actually freed his slaves. It, it was after he was appointed territorial governor. You might want to elaborate a little bit on that because it's kind of a sad story, really. It's a very sad story. With only 20 minutes, I didn't have time to go into that. But I have a whole section of my book on actually who those people were. So those enslaved black workers, um, I'm pretty sure that one of them was a enslaved boy that he was given when his father died in Israel Dodge in 1806 in St. Genevieve. He was given a, a young boy named Toby. And Toby, you find him in the record in the, as the name Toby here in Wisconsin. And then he's like 35 years old. And it, you know, that's exactly the correct age that this Toby should be. So it seems quite likely it's the same person that, um, was enslaved as a child by his father. So, um, and the story of their manumission, the papers are at the Southwest Wisconsin room here in Platteville. So of course I've reviewed all those records because I'm writing a book. <laughs> so, you know, I have to have the story, but yes, thank you, Ed. I uh, appreciate your comment. And I agree completely that we need to keep talking about enslaved persons in non-slave areas. We need to keep talking about how People of power like Henry Dodge, he was the first territorial governor. They did a lot of illegal things quite knowingly and quite brazenly and got away with it. And I think it just goes to show that law and order for the wealthy and the powerful and the well-connected then and now, uh, <laughs> you don't have to follow the rules apparently. It's just a little disheartening to me anyway. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Was he um, related to Grenville Dodge, who was the chief engineer of the Union Pacific? I don't think so. I don't know that name. He um, he yeah. lived in he lived in Council Bluffs. Hmm. I don't know all the names of the children of Augustus. Augustus Dodge, his uh, his second oldest son, his. His son, Henry Lafayette Dodge, was killed out west by Apaches, actually. He was an Indian agent, and he was brutally murdered there. He left his family in Dodgeville, disappeared, left his wife and kids, went off west. Nobody heard from him for a long time until he was actually killed. He um, was the oldest son. The next son was Augustus Caesar. Now, who the heck names their kid Augustus Caesar? I mean, really, that's got a lot of chutzpah to it. But anyway, Augustus Caesar becomes the, 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 the sort of his main uh, child at that point, the person that he expects to take his mantle of power and prestige. So 
justice goes off to Iowa, where there's a lot more opportunities, especially for Democrats. Remember, we're in a transitional period where uh, Whig and early Republicans are beginning to take over Democratic leadership in the lead mine district of the Upper Mississippi. So um, George Wallace Jones and Augustus Caesar Dodge go along to Iowa and become their first two senators when Iowa becomes a state. And I don't know all the children of Augustus Dodge. Hmm. I'll get there, but I don't remember him today. Interesting. Brent, Grenville Dodge was, uh, I think, born around 1840, so he was probably too young to be um, uh, Henry Dodge's son. Well, Henry Dodge was born in 18, uh, 1786, and he was married at age 20. So 1806, and this is his second oldest child, right? Oh dear, we lost her. Well, Tracy, maybe if you watch the, the recording, we thank you very much. And thank you all for, for joining us. I guess that will be the end of our nugget for today. <laughs>